In 2023, the Amish numbered over 350,000 people, and the Mennonites over 2 million. And a large part of their religious and ethnic heritage can be traced back to the Netherlands. This is because a number of religious developments occurred here back in the 1500s, and one of the most important was the conversion of Menno Simons from the Catholic priesthood to Anabaptism, and his eventual leadership of the movement. Although Menno Simons is not the founder of the Dutch Anabaptist Brotherhood, that would be Melchior Hoffman, Menno Simons is often considered to be the founder of the Mennonites. Because as we will see, Menno Simons becomes the leader when Dutch Anabaptism was at risk of losing its original identity and being destroyed by persecution and fragmentation. Just like his contemporary Martin Luther, Menno Simons too was born into a peasant family. Menno was born in the year 1496 and grew up in Whitmarsum, inside the war-torn Dutch province of Friesland. Menno was enrolled into a Franciscan monastery in Balsward, and on March 26, 1524, at the age of 28, Menno was ordained into the Catholic priesthood inside St. Martin's Cathedral in Utrecht, which still stands today. He was familiar with Greek and Latin and had thoroughly studied Catholic doctrine. But Menno Simons would later admit that at this point in his life, he had still not read the Bible. Regarding the scriptures, Menno wrote, I had never touched them, for I feared if I should read them, I would be misled. Behold, such an ignorant preacher was I for nearly two years. His career began with an appointment as priest at the St. Victory Cathedral in the village of Pingjum. Menno Simons was a priest here from 1524 until 1531. Although the church was destroyed and rebuilt, the church tower is the original, which Menno Simons would have frequented. During this time, Menno performed all the ordinary duties that priests were required to do. He read sermons, baptized babies, married couples, and buried the dead. But Menno Simons did not take his life or priestly duties very seriously. Reflecting back, he wrote, I was wicked and carried the banner of unrighteousness for many years. Empty talk, vanity, playing cards, drinking, eating were my daily pastime. The fear of God was not before my eyes. But by the 1520s, Martin Luther's Reformation, which had begun in 1517, was now in full swing and had become an international issue. Every Christian had to choose a side. Either you're sticking with the Catholic Church or you're with Luther and the Reformers who were challenging many of the fundamental teachings of the Catholic Church. And by 1525, it seems that some of the reformers may have started winning over Menno Simons. Menno begins having some doubts about the Catholic Mass, if he as priest is really turning the bread and wine into the actual flesh and blood of Christ. Menno wrote, In the year following 1525, it occurred to me, as often as I handled the bread and wine in the Mass, that they were not the flesh and blood of the Lord. I thought that the devil was suggesting this, so that he might separate me from my faith. I confessed it often, sighed and prayed, yet I could not come clear of the idea. And Menno finally turns to the Bible for answers. Menno Simons wrote, Finally, I got the idea to examine the New Testament diligently. I had not gone very far when I discovered that we were deceived. After reading the scriptures, Menno Simons concluded that the biblical position on the Lord's Supper was a symbolic interpretation called the Sacramental Union, whereby the communion was a memorial in remembrance of Christ, and that the bread and wine were not actually the physical body and blood of Christ. And after his study of the Bible, Menno Simons becomes torn between two authorities, the Bible and the Catholic Church. Troubled by this, Menno Simons consumed himself with the writings of Martin Luther, which taught him that the scriptures should be one's ultimate guide, as it is the word of God. And slowly but steadily, Menno Simons began placing greater and greater authority on the scripture. This marks the beginning of Menno Simons' breakaway from the Catholic Church. <music> then, in 
Then, in March 1531, a Christian by the name of Sika Snyder was brutally beheaded in Leowarden in front of the former chancellery. He was executed for believing that one had to be baptized as an adult, not as an infant, to be a true follower of Christ. This humble tailor believed so strongly in an adult believer's baptism that despite being baptized as a baby, he requested to be baptized as an adult. But all this was against the Catholic Church's teaching that infant baptism gave the assurance of salvation. This was the first execution of an Anabaptist in the Netherlands. And the martyrdom is detailed in the book Martyr's Mere, written in 1660 by Thielman von Brat, which I did a video on. This execution was widely reported, and the news shocked Menno Simons, where he became aware of an adult believer's baptism, and the Anabaptist brethren, and again turned to the Bible for answers. He wrote, Afterwards it happened, before I had ever heard of the existence of brethren, that a God-fearing, pious hero named Sika Snyder was beheaded at Leowarden for being rebaptized. It sounded very strange to me to hear of a second baptism. I examined the scriptures diligently and pondered them earnestly, but I could find no report of infant baptism. Seeing these discrepancies between the teachings of the Catholic Church and that of the Bible, Menno Simons turns to his contemporaries to find out what their support for infant baptism was based on, including Martin Luther, who Menno now deeply respected. However, Menno Simons found that everyone cited their own wisdom in their support for infant baptism, and not the scriptures. He wrote, When I noticed from all these that writers varied so greatly among themselves, each following his own wisdom, then I realized that we were deceived in regard to infant baptism. And we can see from this that Menno Simons is now holding on to beliefs that not only fundamentally contradict the teachings of the Catholic Church, but he's also breaking with the great reformer Martin Luther, who he's developed a deep respect for, and he's siding with the Anabaptist brethren in their opposition to infant baptism and their belief in an adult believer's baptism. By 1531, Menno Simons has become a quiet objector, a rebel within the Catholic Church, holding beliefs that many Anabaptists, such as Felix Mons, Sika Schneider, and George Blaurock have been executed for. Menno wrote, Shortly thereafter, I was transferred to the village in which I was born, called Whitmarsum, led thither by covetedness, and the desire to obtain a great name. Although I had now acquired considerable knowledge of the scriptures, yet I wasted that knowledge through the lusts of my youth in an impure, sensual, and unprofitable life. In 1531, Menno Simons was promoted to the office of village priest in Whitmarsum, his hometown. Although the original church was destroyed by fire, this church was built in the exact same spot and uses the original church bell which Menno Simons would have heard ringing as a boy and then as the town's priest. And it's here in Whitmarsum where Menno Simons comes into direct communication with Anabaptists for the first time. But Dutch Anabaptism is heading towards disaster. In May 1533, the peaceful Dutch Anabaptist leader, Melchior Hoffman, was imprisoned in the Strasbourg prison tower on the top floor, as we saw in another video. Hoffman had spread Anabaptism to the Netherlands. But with Hoffman now off the scene, a follower of Hoffman, named Jan Matthias, becomes the leader of a large portion of the Dutch Anabaptists. And he is not a good guy. He rejects Hoffman's peacefulness and preaches the necessity for violence. Menno Simons publicly reprimanded the calls for violence, and even debated one of the leaders in private, but to no avail. In February 1534, Jan Matthias led the violent takeover of the city of Munster, where he committed horrific atrocities with the goal of achieving equality and the forceful creation of a community of goods. He called for other violent rebellions to occur, and on April 7, 1535, 300 Anabaptists were killed after taking over a Dutch monastery located just a few miles away from Menno Simon's parish. Among those killed was a man named Peter Simons, long thought to have been Menno Simons' brother. When Munster collapsed, countless Anabaptists were slaughtered, and all this misery, combined with his brother's death, 
put Simons into a depressive episode. Menno blames the Munsterite leaders, who had misled many zealous Anabaptists. But he also blamed himself for not doing more, for continuing to live an easy, pleasure-filled life, in comparison to the zealous Anabaptists, who, although misled, gave their lives for their convictions. The Munster Rebellion tainted Anabaptism. Even though the Munsterites rejected almost all traditional Anabaptist principles and practices, the state governments conveniently lumped the Munsterites and peaceful Anabaptists together. The persecution got extremely intense, and the Dutch Anabaptists became fragmented and hunted down. Menno Simons believed the Dutch Anabaptists were now the poor straying sheep who wandered as sheep without a proper shepherd. In early 1535, Menno came before God, tearful and broken. Menno prayed that God bestow him with courage, wisdom, and spirit, so that he could make known God's truth. Until now, Menno Simons has been a supporter of Anabaptism, but only as a spectator from the sidelines. But Menno's prayers for courage were soon granted, and in his preachings from his Catholic pulpit, Menno Simons begins fervently advocating believers' baptism and the symbolic interpretation of the Lord's Supper. For nine months, from April 1535 until January 1536, Menno Simons preached heartfelt sermons, becoming known in the region as an evangelical preacher. When Menno's life became endangered for preaching what was considered at the time heresy, he left the priesthood. On January 31, 1536, Menno issued a statement renouncing infant baptism, worldly reputation, the mass, wealth, his easy life, and the priesthood. That night, he left Whitmarsum and went into hiding, with the help of some Anabaptists. Menno Simons got rebaptized around this time by Obi Phillips and upon his conversion began working tirelessly to establish true Anabaptist congregations. At the end of the year, O.B. Phillips ordained Menno Simons as an elder of the group. Menno Simons had deliberately left his easy life full of cheap pleasures and chosen a life of certain poverty and persecution in order to spread the truth to the world. And for the next 25 years, Menno Simons will redirect the Dutch Anabaptist movement away from apocalypticism and onto a biblical, Christ-centered foundation, where the authority of the Bible reigned supreme. Menno traveled far and wide, meeting with other Anabaptist leaders, winning over new converts, and instructing them. Menno established congregations throughout the Netherlands, Germany, and the Baltic states, going as far as Danzig. Menno Simons would meet with secret Mennonite congregations in hidden, isolated places, such as boats, forests, barns, or in caves. There would be preaching followed by baptisms and communion, and then, if it was safe, they would sing. Menno Simons also wrote letters and books that were mass-printed using Gutenberg's newly invented printing press. His books became widely read by the early Mennonites and have heavily influenced the Mennonite Brethren Church. Let's briefly look at some of Menno Simon's teachings. His most famous was his rejection of infant baptism, believing that infants must come to make that decision on their own in adulthood, after a confession of faith. Menno Simons would famously write that we are not regenerated because we have been baptized, but we are baptized because we have been regenerated by faith and the word of God. Regeneration is not the result of baptism, but baptism the result of regeneration. This can indeed not be controverted by any man or disproven by the scriptures. He believed in religious freedom and a believer's church. Menno promoted strict church discipline and believed excommunication or banning sinners was a necessary tool to maintain the purity of the church. He believed it was necessary for baptized Christians to imitate the life and example of Christ. He believed Christians must physically separate themselves from the presence of degenerate, worldly people. He believed in the separation of church and state, and he believed in the symbolic interpretation of the Lord's Supper. All these beliefs are still practiced to this day by the Amish and by many conservative Mennonites. By late 1536, Menno Simon's affiliation with the Anabaptists had now become widely known. 
because on October 24th, two men were charged and beheaded for the crime of housing Menno Simons. In 1539, Tart Reynerts was executed for housing Menno Simons. And in 1540, Menno Simons surpassed David Horace as the most influential Dutch Anabaptist. By 1543, Dutch Anabaptism was spreading like wildfire, and in response, the Netherlands ordered the death sentence for anyone publishing, spreading, or reading Menno Simons' work. A pardon of all crimes was promised to criminals who could deliver Menno Simons to the government, including a hundred guilders. In 1544, this resulted in the execution of John Kloss in the following year. Kloss had been a prominent Mennonite book printer who had been baptized by Menno Simons himself and printed hundreds of copies of Menno's works. You can find his story in The Martyr's Mirror, which I did a video on, which will be linked down in the description below. Also in 1544, the term Menist and Mennonite began being used in letters as a common reference to the group of Anabaptists that Menno was now leading. Interestingly, Menno had actually tried to stop the group from taking his name, but the name stuck. Menno Simons wrote at this time that he could not find in all the countries a cabin or hut in which my poor wife and our little children could be put up in safety for a year or two. But finally in the summer of 1554, he and his family found safe refuge in Wistenfeld on the estate of Bartholomeus von Alfeld, who had been sheltering Anabaptists since 1543. Although Westenfeld would be destroyed in 1627 by the Thirty Years' War, some artifacts from Menno's time survive in the town, which is now called Oldeslo. This old building, called Mennokate, or Menno Cottage, was used by Menno Simons himself as a printing house, which printed several titles of his work in the 1550s. Although he never permanently lived in the house, he certainly worked in it. Outside the cottage stands a tree, which according to tradition was planted by Menno Simons himself, and is called Menno Leiden. Menno Simons' last days were spent in crutches. He had become a cripple from an accident while on a missions trip. We do not know anything about his son and two daughters. Menno Simons would die on January 31st, 1561, and was buried in his garden somewhere on this property. But unlike most groups who die along with their leader, the Mennonites kept growing. By 1580, 25% of Friesland's population was Mennonite, and the Mennonites have been continuing to grow ever since. If you liked this video, then you will probably enjoy some of my other videos on the Anabaptists, so be sure to check out my YouTube channel. Also, I ask that you please consider supporting my work on Patreon, where you can reach out to me and where all my videos are ad-free. Whether you pledge $1, $10, or whatever you can spare, it really does help me to cover the costs that go into making these videos. Have a very Merry Christmas, and I will see you next time.